Yeah. Well, thanks for everybody joining us for the uh, July marketing meeting. I know that uh, last month I was, I think I was a month behind last month, Sterling and announced it as May, but it, it seems crazy. It's already July. Um, for a lot of us, we are right at the tail end of pollination. I think for most listeners, of course, if you're south, that time has come and gone. And um, really, we kind of find ourselves with a crop that I think all of us maybe 10 days ago thought we were going to have reduced yields. And now suddenly, maybe a ninth inning comeback. I you know I was talking to a friend of mine up in central Illinois, and he kind of coined this thing as a bottom of the ninth rally. And the crop as a whole, it, it may kind of be an ugly year, but it looks like we've made something out of nothing for a lot of places in the country. And Sterling, we've had a pretty good market rally here over the last week. I guess, I guess everybody, the question that I get, and a lot of text messages come through early in the morning, is um, this is a little atypical. We're a little bit past that prime volatility season. What's caused this most recent rally specifically in wheat, then corn, and, and beans are, are kind of following along, per se, the last few days. What's up with all this? Well, let's go ahead here and I'll punch up uh, September wheat and we'll start with that. We have two things really driving the market. Number one, we have weather. And yes, the weather has materially improved. And that's last week's news. This week's news is mat materially weather is going to go back downhill in the Dakotas, in Minnesota, in Iowa, in Nebraska, in Wisconsin, and most of Illinois. We are looking at a high pressure ridge setting up right now. Today is going to be my last really nice day. It's going to be about 82, 83 with low humidity here next week. Our nice rains are going away and we're looking at triple digit heat stretching from Grand Island, Nebraska, all the way into Iowa with highs, maybe pushing as much as a hundred several days next week. All of the rain is coming out of the forecast. And this also includes our friends up in Canada. So they've had a lot of trouble there having obviously the wildfires and everything. Along with that, they're having an unusually high temperature setting record heat, which we've also seen in places as far away as Greece, parts of Italy, um, and other parts of the United States. So that has reignited the weather market for wheat and again for corn. The other issue we have here, and if you can see my chart of wheat, how much we've bounced and we're seeing a little bit of choppiness today, but that's normal after we see it go up 50 cents in one day. The situation in the Ukraine has taken a turn for the worse. First, uh, the Russians have attacked and destroyed some grain infrastructure in the Ukraine. They have also said that any ships heading toward the U Ukraine will be viewed as carrying military cargo. They didn't specifically say they were going to fire on these ships, but uh, they're kind of giving the implication that if we want to, we will. So that escalation has stopped all grain movement coming out of the Ukraine. The grain deal, obviously, that expired on Monday. That has gone away, and any ideas about renewing it or getting a little, uh, a little less likely to happen. So that has added some additional risk premium into the market. You know, Sterling, I, you mentioned that, and that's something that we've talked about almost monthly on these meetings for the last 14 months and something that, um, in February of last year, after the initial invasion of Russia into Ukraine, we talked the, about the importance of Odessa. And Odessa, it, it had seen some damage back in June or July uh, last year, about 2022. But this was the first kind of material targeted attack, targeted attack since then. So Odessa kind of represents not only Ukraine's grain trade, but the Western influence and Western businesses that are in Ukraine. So you've got a lot of familiar names uh, of grain facilities uh, in, that, in that city. So there's some significance there as well when you see Western businesses that, that may be targeted. And I'm not saying that those facilities were, but essentially the infrastructure was damaged. So Russia on the 17th, um, did not sign the Black Sea Initiative, which Sterling alluded to. That wasn't really a surprise to the market. That's something that we had talked about, I think, in the WASDE report uh, previously, Sterling. That wasn't a big surprise. And short term, and Sterling, I want you to correct me if you disagree with this. 
the impacts of that in the short term, meaning 30, 60, 90 days, are somewhat minimal. Um, most of the corn that Ukraine is going to send out has been shipped out. Um, wheat had been offered out, and, and this is one of the reasons it wasn't a huge surprise that they pulled out. A lot of wheat customers are Mediterranean countries, Middle Eastern countries. Russia had most of their wheat offered out in June and July, whereas Ukraine continued to have offers out June, July, August, September. So Russia had been signaling this for for a for a while. Now, the significance, I think, in the wheat market may be symbolic more than anything else, but we're certainly enjoying this. Sterling, any indication of number one, do you agree with those thoughts? Number two, how long can we kind of thrive off of this wheat news out of the Black Sea? It certainly looks like it's not something that may take us to ten dollars, but can we enjoy it a few more weeks? Well, I think the problem is going to come not right now. Right now, at this very minute, the world is well supplied with wheat. Exports from the Ukraine had dropped off to a near trickle. Now, once we start making our way through that wheat, depending on how our spring wheat harvest is and how that works here in this country and how some of those conditions that we're seeing with some drought um, in France and Germany, we'll see how this plays out down the road. And this is something, again, you get the immediate panic buying, okay, and the market went flying up and we saw the same with corn and we're seeing it today. Oh, this is a good spot if I have some wheat to sell to sell it. We're seeing that hedge pressure coming in. Now, when we're having this conversation in October and November, this may be a bit of a different tone when there's no, if there's no grain coming out of the Ukraine and suddenly, you know, Russia is being a bigger problem um, and we perhaps engage in some political activities against them, then we could see the wheat market move higher. So right now the market is comfortable with it. It is going to keep prices somewhat elevated. Um, but we're going to need a little bit more again to get this market going because we are so well supplied. You know, talking about well supplied, Sterling, uh, you know, while we're on that Ukraine subject, we're, we're pretty much talking wheat and corn. And corn has uh, gone up for a lot of the same reasons that wheat has, in my opinion, outside of the weather forecast that you mentioned. But I think that weather forecast for a lot of folks is going to come post pollination, hopefully. There's some later, there's some later planted corn that it's going to hit perfectly wrong uh, in some of those areas, but hopefully it's a little late for most Iowa, most Illinois, most Indiana. But when it comes to the corn situation, we're facing something that we haven't faced in regards to our supply and demand table in a long time. Um, and, you know, it wasn't very many days ago, December corn had a four in front of it for the first time in a good while. Um, take us through just a little bit of, of corn situation that came out of the last WASDE report? Well, essentially what we have with the corn here, and I want to show you some retracement levels with this too. What we have with the corn is we are going to have a lot more corn. There's a number of things driving this one. We are going to see better production. We're going to see more acres. Now, how this sudden new heat uh, bit is going to affect things, particularly where I'm concerned about this is from right here if it's say 50 miles west of Omaha, going east into Iowa and up into Minnesota. This is probably we're through pollination and that's good. However, the soil moisture situation before we got this rain was dismal. And you can look at the drought monitor. Yes, we got rain, but the drought monitor didn't improve because that's a backward looking item. We got the rain that we needed, much like we saw in 2021 here in Nebraska. We got what we needed when we needed it, but we had no extra. Now, we're much drier than we were in 2021 in terms of soil moisture. So how well we do with the filling and are we going to see some harvest in surprises here if the weather does not improve? That is my number one concern with getting the crop. Um, out in this part of the country down by brooks and places in kentucky and down in those areas we're expected to see more moisture which how is your moisture profile looking you know down here um really really good and of course we're in kind of we always joke around we're in a part of illinois that doesn't really matter 
but south of I-70, for the most part, we've had adequate moisture. And of course, if you go down into Kentucky and parts of Tennessee, you know, excessive moisture, you've got a lot of headwater out in fields, but things look pretty good. So, Sterling, you raised the question on yield. Let's go through kind of this corn yield profile from March until today. And I want you to kind of fill in the gaps here. But in March, kind of what we plan on is a trend line yield. Right. And a trend line yield is going to set us up into the low 180s. If I'm not mistaken, it was 181 and change. That's where we came and, in uh, on the May WASD. That's correct. And, and, and we saw some private you know, analysts take us down then to 179 and then 177. And I think there's a lot of talk in the country that maybe we're even a little bit lower than that. And and that's after we've salvaged a lot of acres. I mean, things I think yields have grown over the last 10 days. I'm not I'm not saying what they're gonna do over the next 10 days, but I think that yield estimates have probably grown in a lot of people's mind over the last 10 days. But Let's set this thing even lower, because I think if I polled the audience today, they would say, where are we at at a 177 crop? I'm going to guess 90% of you would say we're below that, okay? I would have said significantly below that 10 days ago, but I, I'm still going to say below, but I, I'm, I'm going to say maybe we're 173. And to kind of illustrate this, that's, that's a fairly unprecedented drop from March of 181 and change down to 173. In most years, that precipitates a really good rally along the way. You can look at Sterling's chart and you can see what happened. That rally was very short lived. And as a matter of fact, that market started to sell off really before any of those material rains occurred in Illinois. It kind of coincided a little bit. But I still think we're below 177 sterling. And here's the problem on corn. When we look at the supply and demand tables on corn, even if we take a crop to 171 sterling, we've got significantly more bushels left over in a year from now than we do now. Think about that, folks. That's at 171, that's 10 bushels less than our estimates in March even with more acres planted than we thought were going to be planted in March. And the numbers work out for more supply, significantly more supply than where we stand right now. That's a, that's, that's a big, big hurdle for this corn. Sterling, how, how do you, what are you thinking on yields? On yields right now, I get some scientific uh, yield estimates that comes that come out of the University of Kansas and Terra Metrics right now they're at 176 spot 8. They tend to run a little bit high. We did improve things over the previous 10 days. We are going to do some damage over the next 10 days. So I think if things normalize out we're going to come in about 174 spot 2 give or take. Now, let's keep some things in mind. Last year, we got a big surprise when the crop tours went out, and things looked noticeably worse when we actually got down on the ground and actually looked at it. Part of that was a lack of fertilization. We did not have the right amount of fertilizers on the crop. This year will be a little bit different, so that should improve things. On the other hand, we added acres. When you add acres, that inherently cuts yields. So... That will be the other thing. So we might see yields, they might tuck in there. We might get in that 173 area. But when you throw an extra couple million acres at the problem, that changes the math, and we end up with that same big production number, and we still have a burdensome balance sheet. So let's, the other, let, let me, let me mention something on that balance sheet, Sterling. So when you, when you and I'm going to oversimplify, um, but when we look at the usage side of it, um, the one thing that's absolutely killing us is is exports and, um, you know, domestic use. OK, ethanol use. OK, uh, we're where we need to be. Exports sterling are absolutely are, are, are hurting us. And, and we got a long time to go. Remember, this marketing year that we're estimating doesn't start until September. It goes through the following August. But we kind of have an idea uh, a few months in advance of, of who our buyers are. And uh, for the most part, we've got steady buying 
from our, our long-term customers. Of course, our short-term customer the last three years has been China. And um, before I talk, I asked Sterling to talk a little bit about China and how they play into buying from us. To give you an idea, let's paint the picture of exports over the last 12 months. First off, last year we come in with some robust estimates. We're, our estimates are that we're going to export 2.4 billion bushels of corn outside of the United States. Okay, that's for the marketing year we're currently in. We're coming to the end of it here in another 45 days, 40 days. That number, that number could come in as low as 1.7 to 1.8 billion bushels. We missed the mark by a lot. Okay, that's what kept us from probably some all-time highs on corn over the last eight months. Um, Ukraine had stepped in, supplied a few of these bushels that we were surprised with to the open market. China did not buy as much corn from the United States as we had hoped. Now we start to look ahead to next year and um, we're optimistic initially. USDA was optimistic. They felt that 2.2 billion bushels of corn could still be exported out of the country. We don't know where that's going to be. We haven't started that process yet. But by all indications, by all indications, especially now that we're kind of over the hump in South America uh, on their Safrina corn, it would appear that that number could be reduced again, Sterling, down to 1.8, 1.85. So again, it looks like we're losing those exports. Is there any chance that? the Ukraine situation, if it got nasty enough over there, could we could we enhance those exports a little bit over the next 12 months? Okay, where the USDA is at right now on the balance sheet is a very stout and enthusiastic number. Corn exports, total accumulated exports for the United States for the current marketing year that'll be wrapping up here shortly will be the worst in the last five years. It'll also be the worst for cotton. And China is playing a big role in that. So how do we get exports better in the United States? First of all, we need less production out of our competitors. That means Brazil needs to export less corn, means Argentina is going to need to export less corn. Brazil had a big record crop and they anticipate a record crop every year. So that one may be a little bit hard to replicate. Maybe they have a little bit lower production. On the other hand, Argentinian production and Argentinian exports stunk the joint up. If Argentina had produced a normal crop, we would have a much bigger problem. So I don't know if we're going to be able to see Argentina <clears throat> produce less. Are we going to need, we're going to need to see one, a step up in consumption. If we can see hog prices in China move higher, that is something that will have eventual knock-on effects that will you know, help push corn higher. If we can see livestock prices globally in general move higher, that will increase, that will give the impetus to increase herd size, and that in turn will increase you know, the need for, uh, for exports. Those are the things that can help us. Otherwise, we are going to be looking at a situation where we may see exports drop again, that will add onto that balance sheet. That two billion carryout number will become a much higher certainty, even if we do see a tighter crop. So that is where we sit. Export sales again this week, not very good. We did see some good new crop numbers, which are finally happening. Usually we see those a lot earlier, but people are being much more willing to be hand to mouth on the idea that prices may not be significantly lower, but a little bit lower, so they're willing to play the game right now. You know, I, I think those are really good points to, you know, we we're concentrating on yield at this point in time. I, I, I know this sounds ridiculous to say, but I'm not sure that two or three bushel change in those estimates of 176 that you mentioned from University of Kansas and 177 are going to be as impactful as they would in other years. So once we get past this yield number, and every day that goes by, we're closer to a known number that throws in there. I don't want to oversimplify this corn market, but if you just take corn by itself, 
We feel pretty confident in domestic consumption. We feel pretty confident in ethanol going forward. We've really, really got to watch uh, these exports. Sterling, you cover those exports uh, on Thursdays, correct? Yeah, That's every, your export day. Every day, I every Thursday, I go through and pay very close attention to the exports because it is the single biggest variable that can change prices. It's that a, is sometimes. number one because yeah. we only get weather for a certain period of time. The rest of the time, we have to deal with what consumption is and exports being the biggest item of that. Um, one thing for our viewers on this corn chart that I have up here that I've been sharing, these are the retracement levels. Right now, this aqua line is the 50% retracement. We traded above this yesterday. We fell down below it. And uh, now, as you can see, we're trading below this 38% retracement right here, which is about 538 and a half, give or take. That's our next major support area for this market. And if we can bounce off of that, we may get a chance to bounce up into here. If we fall through it, we're going to be back chasing $5. So if you're confident in your production, if you are paying attention, and again, I don't advocate selling big chunks at any one given time, but I, I would not feel uncomfortable letting a little bit go at this level. And if you're if you're kind of trapped in that old crop market, certainly, certainly look at these and these levels that Sterling's talking about. Uh, because, you know, most of you don't want to go into fall with unpriced old crop, or you may have customers that, that face that. These are, this is a really good way when, when you don't necessarily like the price levels, but you're running out of time to price. These charts are a great way to make marketing decisions. It gives you something to go off of. Um, Sterling, we kind of segued here. Uh, from corn, and we talked a little bit about production down in South America. Um, when we when we flip over to beans, uh, beans are going to have to lend support to corn in a big, big way. Um, and we talked the last time. You you mentioned that song for the Wonder Years. You know, got to have a little help from your friends. Corn's going to have a best friend over the next few months, in my opinion, and it's going to be named soybeans. Mm -hmm. And here's something I'm going to throw this at you because I think everybody needs to hear this. And before I do that, I am going to put a plug in for your Asna Edge crew. We talked about the importance of exports and corn. Sterling and I are connected into that export market as well as any other AIP marketing team in there. So those Thursday, those Thursday reports. Watch them. It's not just conjecture. It's not just talk. Uh, we've got something to back this stuff up with. But on beans, we've got something I've never seen before. I've never seen this before. I think everybody needs to take note of this. Had the WASD report that we received in July come out at any point in time that I've been in this business in my life, at any point in time, it would have staged a rally that we have never seen. Um, Sterling, I may exaggerate this a little bit and pour some water on my flames, but but here's the deal. Folks, we came out with a lower estimated stocks to use ratio than I've ever seen. In other words, we estimated that we would have fewer beans on hand in just about a year from now than we've ever had. Okay, it was a combination of great demand. It was a combination of fewer acres. And uh, now that we've got a little bit of uh, maybe some adverse weather and a critical timing on soybeans, it could even tick the yields down a little bit. Sterling, if you looked at that stocks to use ratio and what that is, folks, that's a timeless number. It tells us what percentage we have left over of our total supply. It's as low as it's ever been. Beans reacted, and if I've got my dates right, on June 30th, they reacted, we were up strongly. We started the day off on July 3rd. We rallied hard, and by the end of July 3rd, beans started to lose their enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Why in the heck, if you looked at that supply and demand sheet, why are we not up there? What has changed in the world that doesn't allow the United States supply and demand balance sheet 
to really, really take price up like it would have over the last two decades. Well, let's keep in mind the estimates for that crop coming in, we were going to take ending stocks for beans down to 200 million. That was a straight guess. My guess was we were actually going to even take them a little bit lower. So I had shaved a little bit off of yields. The USDA, well, yes, we cut acres. There's no question about that. We cut the acres. They also cut exports, which if I were um, you know, going to pick them, I'd say you'd cut exports for corn before you'd cut them for the beans. But they did cut those export numbers, and that gave our balance sheet – you know, we had the party on the left, and then we had some bad news on the right, and that left us with still a pretty high ending stocks number, and that has contained the soybeans, at least for the time being. Now, the weather over the next 10, let's, let's, let's expand it, let's say the next three weeks. For a lot of beans, especially the late planted beans or the second planted beans that you planted after you planted your corn, we are coming into pod setting. This matters. Our soil moisture is not really, it's better for the moment, but they turn the furnace on back out here and uh, we're pushing 100 degrees and it doesn't rain for a week. That's going to change. And that can take a little bit off of soybean yields. We have to be careful. So They're I'm, very let tricky. Me, let, me, let me interject and ask a question for you. I know that on our balance sheets, we're a little bit lower than where USDA is. I'm significantly lower. You're a little bit lower. In theory, and we can't run out of beans, physically run out of every bean in the United States. We know that. What is a practical number? And, and I'll kind of explain that here in a second, why we can't. What is a practical lowest carryout number that we could potentially get to? Is it 80 or 90 million bushels of beans? I, I would say the 80 to 90, given current crush capacities, given the need for soybean oil as a biofuel, I think before I would say that number was 100 to 110. I think 80 to 90 is probably about as tight as we can get. So we're going to have this balance now. We're going to have, we have China buying more soybeans coming out of Brazil, and Brazil is you know, there to satisfy the market. How many beans do we produce? How many are China going to need? And then we're going to introduce this new risk into the market. How is planting going in South America when that shows up in September? That's kind of our risk sandwich that we have right now. And, you know, soybean yields are very tricky. We could take yields down in the next two weeks. We could see rain show up like we did in 2012 in late August and September, put something right back into the market. That's right. You brought up South America, and I guess I, I, I knew this would come out in the discussion, and this is not, an, this is not a very popular statement. I'm going to make it, and I want us to talk about it, but the United States supply and demean, demand tables on soybeans is now secondary to the world market. And, and, and I'm gonna make that statement and I want you to support it or refute it, but let me explain why I say that. Um, you know, we, we're, we're a secondary market for a lot of importers, um, or they're gonna buy from the cheapest source they can buy with, with relative quality uh, to consider. Um, we are the secondary market for production now. Um, and Sterling, this is something we've talked about and looking forward to this. Because of that, our June, July soybean rallies may not be what they once were. The volatility is still gonna be there, but maybe not to the degree it was 10 years ago. South America certainly looks like they're, they're and I'm not even gonna say demand, but their supply side. That's the left side Sterling was talking about. That's the party that he was talking about earlier their supply side is probably the most important aspect to soybean price that's out there. What does that do for us as producers and sellers of soybeans inside the United States when it comes to timing? And do we have any other times on the calendar that you feel will be enhanced in the future uh, because of what I just said? Well, we'll have new risk 
market risks coming in actually coming into the fall because you'll have two things going on. You'll have harvest and potential harvest risks in the United States. Along with that, you'll have crop and production risks in Brazil in particular. And we need to really pay closer attention to Brazil than Argentina. Brazil is improving their agricultural infrastructure. They're improving their techniques. They are increasing their land. We are seeing material improvements in their production. And if you look back over the last five, say seven years, the amount of beans they produce has gone up. Argentina, not so much. Argentina is the processor to the world right now. That can change. The uh, biofuel needs for the United States are going to increase our crush capacity. The best export sales numbers we got today, Brooks, were for what? I have not seen any reports today, but I'm going to guess soybean meal. Soybean meal, exactly. And that's something that can help work this out, especially we need to make friends with our friends in Rotterdam, and we need to make sure we are moving that soybean meal into Europe. If we can do that, that will alleviate at least some of the problem of China buying more soybeans from Brazil, which is what they want to do. And the soybean situation, I'm a little less concerned about than I am really about the corn situation. I, I agree. And let, let's uh, let's sift through some of what we just said. And uh, let me give you a little, I know some of you have specific marketing concerns here. I get a couple of texts along the way, and those help guide the conversation, folks. So if you've got anything to to uh, put out there on the, um, oh, if you want to put anything on the board, the chat board, please go ahead and do it. Send me a text. Okay, so in real life, what does this mean to the farmer? <clears throat> this puts the farmer in a conundrum because a lot of farmers need cash and need physical grain movement and harvest. In other words, they don't have the bins to store the product, and they also need money um, to function. We've got a lot of bills coming up. You know, uh, there's, that one, there's that one really important bill that you get called crop insurance. And of course, it comes up here pretty soon at a time of the year where a lot of uh, corn and beans are turned into cash. So if we look at this at face value, and this is gonna be tricky, Sterling just said it right there. He's more concerned with corn than he is with soybeans. And when you look at soybeans, you're seeing futures right now hover where Sterling, we're up in the 14, just right above 14, if I can see your screen correctly. $14.02. Here's, the, here's, what, here's what logic tells us. Logic says, if I've got to turn a crop into cash, it takes fewer loads of soybeans to equal more dollars. We know that. And the price, if you just look at the price at 14 versus prices in the fives, mid fives on cash corn in the fall, I know that they're a little bit less than that when we go further to the Northwest. But I think it's human nature to say, I'm going to take beans to the market in the fall and sell those. And I think that's fine. There's nothing wrong with $14 November futures. That's over two dollars better than we were in may if you look at sterling's chart there um there's nothing wrong with that and i think i would probably opt to do that however just remember what sterling just said if you look at it from a return on your storage and the importance of december 1st through january 15th if you if you if you're if you're asking Sterling and I right now which commodity could appreciate the most in those bins, which could you gain the most carry on, we're probably both going to say beans, and that puts us oh, yeah. in a really oh, tough yeah. situation when it comes to to knowing what to move. And I'm going to tell you, I think most farmers will default to move beans. Fewer loads, more dollars. We like fourteen dollars better. But for a return on investment on your space, um, probably going to have some more opportunities on on beans. And again, what's it come back to? It's come back to what Sterling talks about on Thursdays. It's what we, we talked about on corn. We don't have the domino effect, the demand domino effect, I like to call it, on corn, where one market drives another one. So 
Is it the domestic market driving the, it's usually the export market putting pressure on the ethanol market, putting pressure on the domestic rail market that causes good pricing opportunities. And when you have one of those lagging behind, or I wouldn't say non-existing, but non-aggressive, which IE exports this year, uh, it reduces the opportunities that you have, especially on basis. Uh, Sterling, what, what do you think about those thoughts? Well, here, you know, I'm going to prove it to you right here. I'm going to bring up a chart, and this is part of what I put out on Thursdays, and I'm going to share this here because this really matters, and this explains it all in one really simple picture. This is a chart of soybean export inspections. So before beans leave the country, they get inspected. And this comes out every uh, Monday, and we put it in a Thursday report. As you can see, right now, this blue line is where we are. We are in the trough for soybean exports, meaning we're not inspecting any and we're not moving any out. What we have stretching from starting right here in September, oh, we go bananas because we are harvesting beans. And we are exporting those beans, and we move those out in front of everything else. What that means when we get out here into March, April, May, we are tight on soybeans in the United States. Now we know that we're gonna have more crushing activity. What does that mean? That means the potential for basis is gonna come up, particularly if we see very good demand for diesel and biofuels. We can all offload the meal, we can move the meal. Argentina is quickly falling a little bit behind and while we talk about soybeans and we say we are a secondary market, yes, we produce less. But the content in the soybean meal we produce is easier to, easier to digest by the animal. It is a better quality soybean meal. So if you look at China, they're interested in producing things in massive amounts. In Europe, a little more interested in quality. In Japan, you're a little more interested in quality. So that will probably improve our demand for meal and this in turn gives you a situation as you're moving out away from the traditional export months of being able to see a little a little better basis coming out of these crushers you know sterling to, to add to that some of you live in these kind of these sweet spots but i don't know if this is the case anymore and if some of you are plugged into that export market currently let me know but for a long time there was an IOM um, program and um, Japanese buyers of meal would pay small premiums for Indiana, Ohio, Michigan soybeans uh, because of that quality that, that Sterling's talking about. While we're, while we're talking about meal, two things. Sterling, can you pull that, that export inspections chart back up? Because I want to show somebody this and, and show I think some folks, I, I shouldn't overstate this, but I'll show some folks a way to maybe manufacture 25 cents in marketing uh, opportunities. If you've got bins, if you look to this side of the screen, I'm not the left side of the screen where you see that big spike that goes up, <clears throat> okay? There's the double whammy here, okay? We've got, uh, we've got exports leaving. We've got some nearby sales. Also, what's happening in South America in December through January 15th? Um, Drop centering got, reproduction is what's going on. There you go. So be watching the futures market here. Okay, this is where your futures only contracts, your hedge to arrive contracts come into play. Even if you don't want to sell anything in December or January, if you've got the ability to hold beans, <clears throat> beans generally store a little bit better than corn if they're put in the bins dry. As you drop off to the right side of this chart, Sterling talks about domestic demand and a fight for domestic soybeans. What happens then, Sterling? Your futures may not do anything, but you've already locked those futures in. What do you look for then? Well, what I would look for, obviously, is an improvement in basis. And what you want to watch is something that I've thrown into the uh, uh, podcast. If you're listening to them, watch the crush margins. And I give you an old crop and a new crop crush number. That old old crop crush right now is at 224. That's up 13, trading 187 on the new crop. So we're seeing, again, we're looking for beans, and they're willing to pay for them, and everyone's looking for meal and oil. 
So again, another argument that defies a little bit of farmer logic here. If I if I've got bin space for one commodity or the other, and I'm looking for a payoff on that space, this is another really really good argument for soybeans. Now, a lot of farmers don't like to hold soybeans that far in, but they're generally rewarded on basis to do that. Right, especially and, May through through August. Right. So, and what you can just, do is if you want to put in an option strategy to protect your board, let's say we get a really fat board here, you can look at a cheap option strategy to kind of guard the board, and then you can go looking for that basis. So just to, just a couple things there um, to think about. Soybean meal again, and Sterling will go on to the next slide, but soybean meal, remember, Argentina, terrible crop last year. Uh, soybean meal going to be in pretty good demand in August and the early parts of September in the U.S.? Yes, they will. If you're fortunate enough to sit next to a processor, it's probably going to be on the Ohio River. Uh, lower miss, not any opportunities down there to speak of. If you're on the Ohio River, if you're close to Cairo, if you're close to uh, Cairo, Illinois, if you're close, close to Mount Vernon, Indiana, Owensboro, Kentucky, on up into Ohio, and you happen to have September beans um, that are heading to the marketplace, be watching those premiums. They're already posted now for first half September, at least in the Ohio Valley where there is a 20 to 40 cent premium for beans delivered by September 15th, uh, a little less for full month September. It's about a 20 cent premium on the bids I've seen out of three processors for September. Be watching these. And here's the thing. I don't want to be last year. We saw premiums go basis go a dollar over. I'm not sure that's going to be the case once we get past September 5th through 10th, because on average, what we've seen is these beans were planted quite a bit earlier than they were last year. In some cases, as acreage reporting is coming in, we've seen beans in some areas planted on an average of 21 days earlier than they were in 2022. So I think there's going to be a lot of beans available in September. Obviously, most of those are going to be last half September. So don't get too greedy on that basis when it comes time for delivery September 15th through October 1st. Uh, if you see a 20, 30 cent premium, I think that's a pretty good opportunity, but be on your toes with that because that can help, especially if you have to move beans to town. Yes. Yes, I, I would agree. And if you're going to move them, if you've got them to move, try to move them before September 15th, because once we get past that, you know, I think you're going to see some arms folded and people willing to wait and go a little hand to mouth for a week or two to avoid paying up. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Sterling, I've had, we've had a week question kind of come through for from Jason on chat, and uh, I know we're going to transition to weed at some point in time. Now is probably about as good a time as any. Um, we did have a lot of multi parallel claims early in the year uh, down in the southwestern portion of the United States uh, on wheat. Uh, the question was, have these hard red wheat yields been factored into the balance sheet, or is the market still still pending some final results. Sterling, you want to tackle that one? Uh, I think we're about 60% harvested. Harvest is running a little bit slow. We have completely factored this in. We knew it was going to be bad. And as usual with wheat, it gets better as you harvest it. So I think we have completely factored those ideas in completely. And now we're looking, we're going to be looking at spring wheat and looking at the global situation. So any help you're going to get from here, that help is, you're going to need help from me. It's either going to come from the Russians or come from Mother Nature and Canada. We are going to see materially less crops coming out of Canada. That is going to happen. And that is helping set the stage. And if you look at this chart, it's not really that bullish. We are seeing the lows of the market are beginning to move up. Our problem is... When you look at this, we got a wall right here, and this is Kansas City wheat. There's a wall right there, just shy of uh, $9. If we can get above that, that's going to change things. But right now, we get up there, there's more people 
uh, willing to sell you wheat at $9, and there are people willing to buy it, and that is a problem. The other interesting thing I see right now, Minneapolis wheat is at eight ninety two and a half. That's down four and three quarters on the day. Minneapolis wheat relative to Kansas City wheat is looking a little bit cheap. So if we see things dry out, we could see spring wheat uh, maybe take the lead here and help pull the rest of this higher. Well, let's talk about that important soft red wheat crop, Sterling, since mm -hmm. it's in my backyard down here. What's going on in Chicago? Why can't we play these games uh, with Kansas City and the and the Minnesota folks? Here? Well, the problem with uh, Chicago wheat, one, obviously of the wheat global wheat qualities, this is the lowest, so that makes it one problem. The other thing is uh, the people in Connecticut and uh, you know off of Yamato Road down in Florida and the hedge funds, they play this, but they have built a huge short position in here. And how they drive the market is really more of a manipulation of that short position. I think if you're a fund and you want to come in here and buy wheat, you know, you, you will buy Kansas City. And if you're brave and know what you're doing, you will buy Minneapolis simply because it's easier to ride a bull in a market expanding than it is a market that where somebody wants to go along corn, they seem to sell Chicago wheat against it for some reason. That's That's our problem with this market. Very, very interesting. That's how, what I was hoping you were going to get at is the speculators have offered Chicago wheat no help and have not been friendly prices for a long, long period of time. Well, um, th there's been a, there's a war. There was a war. And we're going to go back in time here. We're going to go back to 2009. And when they had to put in the VSR, Wall Street traders had driven the the Chicago wheat market so far out of alignment that there was never convergence between the cash and the futures market. And we've seen similar problems in the cattle market at times. And when this happened, well, the funds just decided, you know, what do we do? Well, we sell wheat in Chicago. Buy three corn, sell a wheat in Chicago. That's just their thing, even though the two markets have only a, you know, small relationship in reality. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, so wheat folks, we got wheat in the bin. Um, I think you gave some really good advice on hard red as far as, you know, levels that we need to look at. There's still a lot of wheat unsold, whether that's soft red or hard red out, out West. This looks like a little bit of an opportunity here over the last few days. And I don't want to go back to Ukraine, but how long can we ride this Ukraine train on all of the wheat markets right here? Um, well, it I, I made the statement that it may not have huge impacts on world supply. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, the world supply situation, this can improve it. The problem is you're dealing with a politician. And two things that are unreliable. My weather forecasts are reasonably reliable that I get. Trying to, you know, getting political forecasts are a completely different matter. The Russians could come in here and have a sudden change of heart. And that'll take risk premium right back out of this market. They sink a couple of ships, you know, we got a different story. So it's something where we, we don't have a lot here we can rely on. We have two situations when if you just have one, if you have weather, as we've seen in the corn in the last, you know, three weeks, that's bad enough. When you throw weather and a war together, now you're basically, basically you've got wheels spinning like a slot machine. Maybe it lands, maybe it doesn't. So I would know areas that I think are good if, you know, if the market begins to stall out up here, right where we are with Chicago, right here, and we can't start to move up. Guess what? People who are long down here who have made money will get out, and that will send prices lower. So if we can't keep the momentum in place, go ahead and let a little go every day. Just a little bit. You know. well, let's talk about that momentum. I, I look down at the bottom and, and tell me what kind of chart you've got down there at the bottom and why it may be important for that crossover. That red line is is when we cross over that red line. Uh, has that been a pretty good time to pull the trigger? Well, if we look uh, guide the future by the past and right here, we got above it and we stayed overbought for about three days. This is a relative strength indicator. And as you can see, if you sold that, boom. You did quite nicely if you'd sold it somewhere in here. Let's say you didn't sell the high, but you sold it at a reasonable price. We'll call it 750. 
you could have easily come back here and bought it oh at about 650 that's a dollar a bushel so if you put your hedge on and put it on right you decided well i think prices are going up boom you just locked up a dollar a bushel which you put that in the bank that's improved your situation materially if you do nothing so again we aren't quite to that uh, overbought level and again I'm going to warn people is particularly you know things like the stock market we can stay overbought for extended periods that's why we don't get too crazy with things but generally speaking th these have been good selling areas in here and we're not quite there yet but we don't have to get there necessarily to go down so again let's pay attention and make sure if we you know today's low is actually a pretty good anchor price 711 and a quarter 712 we come back through today's low the party's probably over yeah Remember, remember to think about that RSI <clears throat> as your gas tank and uh, above 50%, you know, you've got that, that half the full tank. That's always a more favorable time uh, to be a seller. Whereas if you've got below that half tank, it's not uh, some kind of a throwback from uh, some of the old indicator days, but certainly when you need to make this, you need to, when you need to make decisions and you're kind of running out of time to make those marketing decisions, I always try to default to something like those charts that Sterling had up or something like this RSI to give me clues as to when to uh, when to sell. Yeah, it, it's no no single indicator is going to be perfect, but as you begin to see things line up, and also when you look at your own farm balance sheet and you see, hey, these levels are profitable, you know, pay attention. And we're right in that period of time where, like my old boss at City said, have your head on a swivel. Because, as we saw with corn, opportunities are fleeting. So if you know your levels, you can put in an order above the market, you know, be comfortable as long as you're confident with your production. Yeah. So, Sterling, you talk about you talk about profitability and, wow, you know, there's so many variables in this thing uh, anymore to that, that, that drive profitability. And it's, it's so different from neighbor to neighbor. Uh, primarily based on, you know, what kind of burden they've got on equipment, land costs, uh, labor. Those are kind of your differentiators on the expense side. One thing I've had a, a several farmers call me about over the last week is they are locking in some nitrogen products for next year. It seems a little bit early to be thinking about that, but uh, specifically your liquid nitrogen is your 28%, your 32%. Those prices are significantly lower than what they were able to book last year. What drivers do we need to look at at the market when making those decisions? And, and, and not everybody's going to do this, but everybody that's on here, that if you are a farmer, if you are an agent and you have the capacity, especially to take delivery on some of this, there may be some opportunities here. Why are these opportunities occurring? Well, one thing, this is a chart of natural gas. This is probably the best single chart we have to look uh, at anhydrous prices, fertilizer prices in general. This is one of the main drivers. And if you have good values now, values that you know will be profitable on your farm, I strongly suggest taking at least some action on this. Right now, what were Brooks and I talking about uh, here just a few minutes ago, this place called Ukraine? Now, Ukraine and the Russian situation can lead to materially higher natural gas prices. I'm going to squeeze this chart back here. I'm going to throw in when the war first started. And this isn't as high as natural gas actually got for a delivery contract because this is a deferred contract. But as you can see, we were trading up here near $6. Right now, we're trading at about $278. Now, this chart, if you look at this, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here so we can get a little bit better picture. What do we have going on here? Well, we have a market that got completely de decimated. You know, it lost 70% of its value. What's going on right here? Well, look, prices are beginning to pick up. We set up a little bit of a range. We moved out of there. Now, if we go back here, we'll look at this recent high against this recent high. Okay. So we're beginning to see a market that is beginning to get some life in it. We have... Three things that can drive natural gas prices higher. One, problems with Russia and Europe in that sense, prices spiraling higher. Um, the European economy is very shaky. Uh, some of the uh, 
uh, subsidies that uh, they had in the UK for uh, handling higher energy prices have been repealed for the time being, which on one level, okay, that sounds good. That means things are getting better. If you're Vladimir Putin, oh, they took away these subsidies. Well, here, I can cause more upheaval if I turn off the spigot to the natural gas going into Germany and consequently into the UK. So we do have some specific things right here that could lift natural gas prices. The other thing is it's hot. It's hot everywhere. 25% of the electricity made in Phoenix is made with natural gas. Same story in Texas where it's getting hot. Bit of the same story right here in Nebraska. So if we see temperatures continue, August is going to be hot. It's typically the hottest month of the year. That can drive things up. And then there's this other thing called winter. And we've moved into an El Nino, which means we could see a little bit colder winter than what we've gotten by with here in the past, so we could see more volatility. So we have a number of things here that could drive natural gas prices up, and that in turn would drive fertilizer prices up. So this is something, if you have some opportunities here, this may be a good time to, uh, you know, get, get some minimums purchased. And, you know, this is going to take a lot of... Uh if we can, if we can do this, and not many farmers will have the ability to lock these in early. Uh, if you lock these in through a dealer, I'm sure that there's still probably discounts involved versus what you're going to be able to buy these on the spot market come February and March. And these, at least I, I, I like them, and they're significantly less than they were last yeah. year. Um, this may be setting us up for, you know, a, a, a situation that, that looks like a... a, a 450 to five dollar type corn market. Um, it, it 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 certainly looks like maybe those first steps. The balance sheet would favor that kind of range, and then all of a sudden, with these expenses where they're at, it it looks something like that. While the two aren't related, uh, you know what? Uh, how many times have you been through this? If you look, if you put a corn chart on top of this nat gas chart, they look eerily similar. Uh, with an expense situation and an income situation. Yes, yes. So again, if you have the opportunities here, you probably are going to be ahead of the game doing this because the prices that Natty got down to were depressed and not really sustainable anyway. So most likely we're going to need to punch back up into a higher range. While we're talking about expenses, uh, one thing that's going to come out if it hasn't already uh, if you have, if you are a marketing rep on here, um, I know Jody has sent some some videos out on margin protection. Um, if you are a farmer, you make sure you ask about margin protection. Uh, but uh, there's a pretty good short two minute training video that's out there. Margin protection, of course, is a product that you have to sign up early for. Sign ups coming up right around the corner, <clears throat> and it does address these expenses. And uh, you really, really need to look into the program. There's there's obviously a fit for some out there, but you need to know exactly kind of kind of know what your expectations are to use that product. Just just a reminder to if you're a farmer, ask your agent about it. If you're an agent, ask your marketing rep about it, because um, we're going to come up with some basic training on margin protection. And it is a product that addresses these expenses, just like we talked about. Absolutely. Now you want to see something completely different. Let's hit us with it. Okay, here you go. These were delisted 11 years ago uh, this week. This is a chart of pork belly prices. And right now we're at $1.92 a pound. And this is how quickly things can change. I want you to keep this in mind with things like fertilizer, things that we can't really, uh, not always can hedge. As you can see, we have climbed, oh, how much is that from the lows in May? Is that 168%? What it looks like. Yep. And this is driving the hog market. Hogs are sharply higher again today in the cattle market. We are making new record highs in the cattle market. So what this means is we're seeing the post uh, price rally in the grains. We're seeing the, the same thing we saw in 2013, 2014 uh, after the drought in 2012. Eventually this will stop. But what this is doing is this is paving the way for better uh, better production down the road. And uh, this will allow for ex eventual expansion of the cattle herd because prices will be high enough 
and the turnaround time is enough that we can see eventually some improvement in feed demand, but that's something you know, that's probably best saved for next year or maybe even the year after. Pretty interesting. And Sterling helped me out in case you got trivia night. Um, I contributed to this rally. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows that. And I bet a lot of people contributed to this. And this is uh, Sterling has coined this. He's got his own vocabulary out there in Nebraska, but this is called the BLT effect, folks. Sterling, you want to explain that? Bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. This time of year, if people have a garden, you're often making your harvest. A lot of people grow tomatoes and lettuce, even in town here. So guess what? That increases demand for bacon along with it. And it doesn't take that big of an increase in demand to, to change price. Along with that, when it's hot like this, are you going to order that BLT or are you going to order that big, thick, overstuffed hamburger? All of a sudden, sales of bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches in restaurants go up or it becomes a promotional item. And here we can do something really cool here show you something that goes on particularly with the belly market and we're going to look at belly prices going back 20 years and we're going to put this on a see in that chart useful boy can't you just drive lots of knowledge from that we click on heat map here and we're going to look at july average gain in belly prices 19 to 20 percent and you can see going up very consistently Fall out of bed in August, which means hogs will probably have a problem. But we climb again in September. Very often you see school lunch purchases. You see military purchases. And along with that, uh, you very often see uh, promotions coming out of big food vendors, you know, the McDonald's and people like that. So an interesting seasonal trade here with a natural tendency for things to go uh, to go higher with the belly market. And we clearly... Uh, you know, this year, sharply higher for the month of July. Pretty interesting. Sterling, what other commodities are out there that we need to, uh, or down the kind of, an, we, we put in an hour so far, but is there anything that we've forgotten that just, that piques your interest out there that we need to look at? Watch your diesel prices. Uh, crude oil had been very happy right around $70 a barrel, and we'd done very nicely. It looks like for the exporters, well, they were happy at 70. Well, they think they can get 75, and they're succeeding. And that's putting a little bit of a bid under, under the energy market, and we may have pushed that a little bit higher. Uh, interest rates are noticeably higher today. We're seeing some uh, change going on in the stock market. Most of this nice rally we've had, and we've had a pretty good rally in stocks, have been attributed to seven stocks moving higher, which normally is a little bit scary. You don't want that level of market concentration. But today, the Dow is up three quarters of a percent. The S&P and the NASDAQ are a little bit lower. So we may be see that, seeing that rally balance out and flatten out. And that is good news if it's becoming broader. The second half of July, leading all the way into an Oct September, October bottom, can be a terrible time for the stock market. There is a distinct history that July's have turned very bad. We collapse coming in and we lose maybe 15 or 20 percent coming into September and October and then we finish the year making record highs. So there's a lot of trade right now kind of watching for this sort of behavior again this year and we'll see whether we see a broad-based rally or if we get that sort of concentrated behavior. Um, the Fed is most likely going to hike rates again. Inflation has come down, and it is coming down globally. But I think he's going to do one more. He just wants to make sure, because we're right now at that period of risk. Inflation has come down. What they don't want is to see it come back up. And this is something where if we see energy prices move, something like that, uh, we could see that happen. Along with food prices, I think food inflation is going to be a continued problem. We know we're going to have it in the livestock space. We're going to have it with vegetable oil. And those two items are enough to keep uh, things elevated, even if we see commodity prices back up. Yeah, I think, uh, Sterling, we're all kind of looking to it at uh, our investment portfolios that are out there. And I'm going to have, I'm gonna put you on the spot there <clears throat> because we've had some really, really strong markets. But to your point on 
on rates. Um, something changed uh, with how T-bills have been purchased over the last few months. This is kind of interesting. And uh, you can see the guidelines that go behind these and how they coincide with movements. But um, the, the limiting number of dollars on a T-bill six months ago was minimal. Uh, I want to say it was in $20,000 increments uh, that a lot of companies would allow you to purchase T-bills. What that would do is it would allow your ordinary investor to step in and lock in a, a T-bill rate for, for 12 months. Those guidelines changed a lot about 30 to 40 days ago, and the minimums went up significantly. And it differed from company to company, but some of them all of a sudden went to $150,000 minimum. Sterling, I'm seeing those back off just a little bit over the last few days, now back down to 100. How does that, does that have any play into the, the yield? or is that a mechanism of, of demand for the product? Do you know the answer to that? Well, part of it is they're trying to control their expiration risk on things. So making, if, if I'm a given company and I need, I have money that I buy T-bills with to collect the float on, I need to control how soon those expire so we don't get a situation like we saw with those banks in California that had lent money out for two years, suddenly they had demand demand for deposits and got themselves in a problem. Yeah. That is the first thing that's going on. We're still seeing an extreme yield curve inversion here where we are looking at, right now we are looking at interest rates. Uh, you know, two year will pay you 487, a 10 year will pay you 384. So basically you get a full percent right there. Now we've seen the back end of the curve, the uh, 30 years now at 390. So we have seen some normalization. At some point there is going to be a normalization of the yield curve. And most likely that'll begin when the Fed says, no, we're not gonna be hiking rates anymore and the market actually gets confidence in that. I don't think you're gonna see 30 year rates move above the two year at 487. What I think you're gonna see is short term rates are going to cave in. Because we've reached a situation where, you know, very near term money is paying very, very well. It's paying too much. And eventually that's going to eventually that's going to normalize. Most likely normalization, I think, is the short end of the curve gets tighter, which means if you buy a two year two year at forty seven in a year, you can, you know, get paid four eighty seven for that first year, get capital appreciation on that bond if suddenly these rates are back down to let's say, you know, three thirty five. So there, there's some interesting things going on here. So far, we've avoided the recession that the yield curve uh, is predicting is going to happen. But, you know, eventually a recession will happen and someone will attribute it to that yield curve inversion. But for now, the economy is doing okay in many areas. We do still have a lot of isolated problems. Housing affordability being a big issue, along with that food affordability being another problem. And the labor shortage is still, while it's stratified and in certain areas, we're still seeing labor shortage in highly skilled jobs. And the McDonald's down the street from me has raised their wages once again, because again, you can't find help there. You know, Sterling, a, a little clue, and I know that you've been leery of these equity markets and kind of, I don't know, giving giving warning for a while of what will happen eventually. You just kind of said it. We're, it will. We will recess eventually. Eventually, and, eventually, something will happen to to cause a market upset. We've done well, and right now, actually, here, let me see here. I have a chart that kind of explains how exactly I feel about the S and P five hundred here, and let's see here if I can find it. SP. Uh, while, you're, while you're pulling that up, uh, maybe maybe one of those precursors has, has occurred. I mentioned the T-bill. A lot of institutions were allowing you to use a T-bill as ultimate margin against S&P positions and other equity positions. In other words, you could leverage your dollar. You could buy that T-bill and... Um, you could also buy or sell the S&P 500. Of course, most people were buying. And then your profit or loss would simply be added to your balance at the end 
of that one year or six month expiration, whatever T bill expiration you, you chose about again, about four or five weeks ago, a lot of institutions changed the game on that and said, no longer can you use this T bill uh, as initial margin on those other positions. So um, it's going to be interesting. Sterling mentioned long term rates may not come down. Uh, they may stay pretty, pretty aggressive at around 5, maybe north of 5 uh, over the next you know, few months. That's going to be interesting to see if money is pulled out of the equity market because of that. Well, right now we're seeing actually we're starting to see funds moving out of the prime money markets and moving back into the equity markets. But where we're seeing that, we're seeing it at the Charles Schwab level, yeah. which, again, you want to be leery of what the retail guy does. Retail is the guy, oh, I read an article this weekend that blah 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 is going to do blah 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 blah. They go in and trade on Monday and they lose. They lose. So when we see retail coming into the market, that is, and you know, the meme guy's got in trouble or the hedge funds got in trouble for picking on retail, but it's true. They're often in the market late. Now, my concern right here, this is the all-time record high in the S&P. This is where the market made a significant failure, and we came in and went into the bear market. Go ahead and share that, Sterling. Okay, let me find here where I can share this chart, because this is a very, very interesting uh, look at things. And boop. So, right here, this is, and I, I always hate talking about psychology, but... If we can go and make a new record high, we're going to see FOMO like you haven't ever seen before. FOMO is the fear of missing out, meaning I'm more afraid of not making money in the market by not being in the stock market than I am losing money, and that will produce a very nice rally. Right here is the area where we conked out last time, and this is no man's land in here. If we go up in here and we turn back through it, that's a problem. If we bounce and yesterday was the high, we kind of have a problem. And so we're entering a situation where are we going to see record high? The third scenario, which happened in 1998, we had a correction down here and we dropped significantly. We dropped 20%. By December, we made a new record high. Just one possibility, but using 1998 as an analog year with recessions, kind of like we use analog years with weather, there there is some merit and some ideas to that. So kind of watching things, and I had been mostly long NASDAQ stuff in the last month and a half. I've reallocated to be more, will we see this broad-based thing? or with a hair trigger ready to blow it all back into cash if need be. Interesting. So. Well, Sterling, we're, um, we're an hour and 12 into this thing, and I know we could go all day long and we could revisit and talk about things we missed on corn and bean all day long. Um, I haven't had any text here in the last 20 minutes to kind of guide the conversation. I don't see anything out there on chat. Um, upcoming upcoming dates, um, we're going to have our WASI coming up here in August. Okay. Uh, we'll do that report. Uh, of course, another marketing meeting. As far as big reports, we really don't have anything probably coming. I think the next big report I would watch out for is that stocks report at the end of September. Sometimes that throws a, a wrench in some things, even though it's kind of silly to have one at that point in time of the year. But, but yeah, uh, it can be a marketing market movement. Uh, November is an important month with USDA for kind of a final yield number uh, kind of settle out there, but not any big, big market movers as far as uh, that, uh, that August WASD, they're probably going to monkey with the yields. So that should be a market mover, depending on how the weather goes. But August is, you know, it's vacation month for a lot of people. So the markets tend to get slow. And we'll, you know, we may have some other volatility, and we also have obviously the weather and the Ukrainian situation. Yeah. So, all right. Well, with that, appreciate uh, those folks that stuck with us through this whole thing. I think we had some pretty good information start to finish on here. Hopefully, you found something that's useful. Everybody enjoy their Thursday and, and Friday, and hopefully, we have a, uh, a rainy and mild weekend ahead of us. Yeah, we're not going to have that here. It's going to get hot.
So we'll keep our fingers crossed in Illinois. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.